I am not a medical man. My claim to be heard is founded not upon education or position, but solely upon what I've seen and what I've suffered. For 17 years, I've been in communication with insanity. And for a long time, I've been impressed with the idea that could this disease be rendered more familiar, but of course less repulsive to the public mind, its chance of being checked and subdued in the first stage would be much greater. In the hope of dissipating this dread and freeing the bright spirit of hope from the talons of despair, I've written this little book. And while keeping truth in view, I've endeavored to strip lunatic asylums of all imaginary terrors and to render them familiar to the public view. Lunacy, like rain, falls alike upon the evil and the good. And although it must forever be a fearful misfortune, yet there is no more sin or shame in it than there is in rheumatism or a fever. Had I the certainty of an attack of insanity before me and the power to prescribe for myself, I'd say, put me in a place where I can do no harm to myself or any other person. And let that place not be a prison in which penance must be undergone and punishment suffered but let it be a place of refuge, an asylum. On the program you're about to see, there will be no actors, with the possible exception of myself, and I'm not going to do any acting. I'm just going to read to you a few pages from a book now and then. We're going to make a journey through the world of mental disorder. It's a world which is unknown, feared by most of us, but not nearly so desolate of hope as we might imagine. One of our guides will be this book I'm going to read from. It's quite a remarkable book, written over a hundred years ago by an unknown man, a former patient in a mental hospital in Glasgow, Scotland. Our other guide, will be a doctor, Dr. William Menninger, one of America's foremost psychiatrists. Through these two voices, one from the present, one from the past, perhaps we'll be able to gain some measure of insight into one of the most urgent health problems of our time, into that vast and greatly misunderstood portion of humanity the mentally ill. And now from the book. I'm glad you came in because I've been wanting to talk to you about your wife's illness. Did you notice when her illness started? Yes, I did, about three months before I taken her to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I noticed strange things happened about her, and uh, I it got so bad that I was afraid to leave her by herself mm -hmm. while I was working, you know. What did your wife do when you, you first noticed she was getting upset? I noticed her doing strange, uh, strange things, such as uh, sitting at the window from morning till night and not dressing uh, at all. And uh, I would talk to her and she wouldn't answer. And uh, in fact, one day that uh, the neighbors told me that she went out in the nude. And one of the neighbors caught her just in time as she was crossing the street and brought her back in. And they uh, was kind of ashamed to let me know anything about it. And. Uh, when I went to pay the rent to my landlady, why, she told me about it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really began worrying. Mm -hmm. 
And another thing that uh, made it seem strange that she was had the Bible in her hand from morning till night, which she never did do before. And I would come home at night and she'd point out verses to me. And she would write notes, you know, and lay in the uh, different pages of the Bible that she had written down. And she would, uh, she was always talking about the stars and moon and stuff like that, you know. And uh, I knew then that something was wrong, but I didn't, couldn't catch it right away. I understand Doris is mute now, that she won't talk to anyone. Was she a talkative person before her illness? Very talkative. She used to be pleasant and, and uh, joyful, you know, and always singing around the house, you know, and uh, well, she always done something to occupy her mind. Could make friends with anybody. She had some friends that uh, came to the house quite often, and she would just sit there and have a wonderful time with them. And uh, when I noticed her getting into this stage, uh, she didn't recognize these same people that she had had a lot of fun with and talked to earlier. afraid of in here. Let's just look around. Would you like to look at some of the books? Why don't you just sit down and be comfortable? Does it make you feel better to hold my hand? You can if you want.
Would it be all right if Mrs. Murphy waited for you in the hall? I'll give you a cigarette before I leave. I'll be right out in the hall. I'll wait for you there. want to do to me. I only want to understand you and to help you while you try to understand yourself. symptoms spring, a reason so powerful in its irrationality as to shake the sufferer almost beyond endurance. And there is a long chapter in the book of human nature, unread by one who would judge an insane person solely by her behavior. From a technical point of view, we know that all of us do have mental devices tricks in a sense that work automatically that try to relieve us when we have a feeling of fear or anxiety or tension. We all of them use, we all of us use these too. When the road going gets rough for any of us, we at times all use one or two major methods of combating the situation. One of them is flight. We take flight from it in one way or another by procrastination or forgetting or neglect or perhaps going to sleep, or running off physically, sometimes maybe getting sick. Or the other reaction is the fight reaction, reaction in which sometimes we threaten and even destroy the situation that we want so much to save. We get angry, we blow our top, we get so mad that we don't uh, think what we're doing, and we destroy the situation. All of us do that sometimes. Life's full of stress, for all of us. When some team goes on too long and is too heavy, they begin to bend and they break. And that's what happened to these patients. 
As we see them here, their action and behavior seems bizarre and strange to us. But really, it's just their attempted solution using the same devices that we use to find a happy way out, but it's so unhappy. Now the job is to help them find a better solution. And that's the assignment that the doctor in the hospital takes on when they come to us. As a flood of fire, from the bosom of a living volcano sweeps down the verdant slope turning flower and fruit into smoke and ashes so does insanity sweep over laughter and happiness and where those glorious attributes once flourished we find only desolation and darkness Yet I may add for the consolation of the afflicted and their friends that the coming of insanity need not permanently injure either the feelings or the intelligence. In the great majority of cases, provided proper treatment is resorted to at the outset, it is curable. Doris, you may sit down whenever you like. really can't help you to decide. When you're a little less afraid in here, it will be easier to decide. At the moment, it seems to me, Doris, you're feeling tight, frozen. Holding yourself in so you won't get hurt anymore. You know, Doris, that I want to help. But I think you can't be sure if you can trust me. If I'll stand by you when you need me, and if I remain with you. my residence in the asylum, my wife visited me upon a stated day each week, and no week passed without her seeing me. Though I was often unable to let her know at the time, these visits gave me something to think upon, being, as it were, a solid spot in a troubled ocean where on the spirit could occasionally rest. <laughs> Doris, did you like the magazines I brought you? Will you read some more if I bring you some? Yes, you find all those cactus roots. Oh, just uh, for one minute. Yeah. Won't you talk to me, honey? Hmm? How do you think I feel when I hear your voice? Don't you think it makes me happy? Don't it? Don't you think it makes me happy to hear your voice? And you gotta make up your mind, Doris. You gotta make up your mind, Angel. To get your mind off these other people, and you got your life to live. Don't forget that. Whose life are you living? A 
going to be in some trouble. You're not living your life. You're living somebody else's life. Tell her something to ask her. I'm going to tell you something now. You ought to see the little place I got now. It's the only damn reason in the world I got it, Doris. You could come home and really fix it up so nice. I got a nice little living room. I got a bedroom, twin beds. I got a nice bathroom, a nice kitchen. And I bought a television set. What do you think I'm doing that for? Not for me, honey. I'm not doing it for me. I don't give a damn whether I just have a, a floor to sleep on. I want you to get one come on. Will you get well? Will you get well? No position can be more honorable than that of a conscientious and humane physician who devotes his time and talents to the treatment of the insane. And what a fearful responsibility clings to the office which he has assumed. For in many cases it lies with him whether the patient be saved or lost. Summary, Doris L, third week of treatment. 
The patient's acceptance of my comb and her desire to take it back to the ward with her are clear indications that she accepts the idea of help and of a doctor. Her previous terror is gone, and in general, she seems to be much more relaxed and comfortable. However, there is still a considerable amount of anxiety present. Each effort of mine to achieve closer contact presents a new threat to her. And in this formative stage of our relationship, there are still many things which she is not yet prepared to accept. Would you be less frightened if I held your hand? Don't take my hand if it will make you uncomfortable. Progress summary, Doris L, sixth week of treatment. The most significant development over the last few interviews has been an increase in the patient's response to the external environment. surroundings, I find that I am beginning to get a clearer sense of the woman beneath the illness.
Doris. Now we're friends. Oh, you did get one. Activity of almost any kind cannot fail of being beneficial, especially if attendants or other sane people can be involved in the enterprise. It breaks up that stagnation of the mind consequent upon the monotony which must ever reign within these walls. for the time from the corroding task of contemplating its own sorrow. week of treatment. Non-verbal contact has been firmly established. It is now time to encourage her to talk. And now this attack on the defense of muteness will undoubtedly increase her anxiety and it may lead to a setback. However, I feel it's a risk worth taking. to understand, but sometimes I can't understand unless you tell me in words. I want to help answer your questions if you feel that you can ask them now. Questions that you may have about being in a hospital. You know you're in a hospital, Doris. This is a hospital. And I'm your doctor. It's not easy when you decide to remove yourself from people. Once it's done, it's even harder to get close to them again, isn't it? I 
I somehow feel that there are things you would like to let me know, but you don't know how. You still have to prevent yourself. you hear, Doris? if you whispered in my ear?
makes you want to cry to think about the things you've lost. of the patient into reality, the first major stage of treatment is over. We're ready now to utilize our relationship in order to help her understand herself and her illness, and also to give her support as she moves into new areas of experience. Some will say, though she appears pretty well now, were she to leave this, who knows, but she might relapse. No doubt she would like to return to the world, but many there would distrust and despise her. No one does so here. However, it is in the busy avenues of men, not in the solitude and shelter of the asylum, that the cure must be perfected. This was an amazing experience. We watched a real patient with a real doctor in a real hospital with a real husband get well, a seriously mentally ill patient. But in a sense, this has created an illusion, maybe. An illusion that I'd like to try to correct if I can. Because I feel so deeply in my heart the suffering and the unhappiness of 750,000 patients in our hospitals in this country, and not a handful of them are getting the treatment that this patient did. Why? Because in that big population, the size of the city of Pittsburgh, there's only one doctor for every 311 patients. What chance would Doris have had if she was one patient among 310 others with one doctor? We try to run these hospitals on the ridiculous sum of two dollars and a half a day per patient. And that includes the board and the room and the clothing and the medical attention. You and I know that it costs 10 times this amount, 15 times this amount to go to a general hospital. What, we can, what can we expect in this field of mental health if we're gonna try to do that kind of a job at two and a half a day? And furthermore, we're starving to death in our field of psychiatry for more knowledge. We ought to be able to help these people more quickly. We ought to be going much further And how do we prevent mental illness. And yet research in psychiatry is a drop in the bucket to the knee. It's the biggest cost of all the health problems, a billion, $200 million a year. And we don't spend one half of 1% learning how to do our job better in this rich land across the country. Where did we could enlist people's understanding of how big this problem is, how neglected, how backward we are in our knowledge of what ought to be done so that many, many girls like this could get well. The facts are that six out of every 10 people that go to a mental hospital never leave it. 
And that doesn't have to be. We've got proof now and can show it that at least eight out of every ten could go home and again be happy and useful citizens. This is a universal problem. It affects us all. It ought to be a concern of every individual as to what can he do about it. So many places need help. They need financial support. They need clear and better understanding. And only as more people do understand is there going to be change. I have a deep conviction that when people know and understand, it will be changed.